This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Welcome to the reading of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for April, May and June 2021. Titled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant, this series of lessons was originally written by Gerhard Hazel. I'm Percy Harold, and glad to be reading this with you. The introduction to this quarter's lessons is simply titled The Covenant. It is based on a series of lessons previously written by Professor Gerhard Hazel, who was the John Nevins Andrews Professor of Old Testament and Biblical Theology at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. For 27 years, he served as director of this department and its programs, and from 1981 to 1988 was the dean of the seminary. The Covenant In 1588, a young English woman, seven months pregnant, looked out over the sea and what she saw, the Spanish Armada with 130 heavily armed ships, planning to invade the island, so frightened her that she went into premature labour, the midwife being fear. Fear, in fact, was an apt image for her child, Thomas Hobbes, who became one of Europe's greatest political theorists. Living at a time when England had been racked by civil war and endless religious violence, Hobbes wrote that people, without a strong, all-encompassing government, existed in a state of perpetual fear. Fear of instability, fear of conquest, and most of all, fear of death. People lived in what he called the war of all against all, and unless something radical was done, he warned that human life would be nothing but solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. What was the solution? Hobbes said that there was only one. The people must place themselves under a single power that would reduce all their wills to a single will, and that would exercise complete authority over them. This power, this sovereign, be it a single man or an assembly of men, though wielding absolute hegemony over the nation, would end the terrible conditions that made their lives so fearful and unstable. In other words, in exchange for all their rights, the people would get peace and security instead. This transfer of power from the people to the sovereign is what Hobbes called the covenant. The covenant idea, however, did not originate with Hobbes. On the contrary, God made a covenant thousands of years earlier with Israel, a covenant whose roots, in fact, went back even further in time. Unlike Hobbes' covenant, which was initiated and promulgated by the people, this covenant was initiated and promulgated by the true sovereign, the creator of heaven and earth. Also, Though Hobbes' covenant was motivated solely by fear, God's covenant is motivated by love. His love for the fallen race, a love that led him to the cross. Thus, because of what Christ has done for us, we love God back. And just as in the Habesian covenant, where the subjects had to surrender to the sovereign, we surrender too our sinful ways, our fears, our twisted notions of right and wrong. We do this not to gain something in return, but because we already have been given the best that the Sovereign can give. Jesus Christ and the redemption found only in Him. How does it all work? It is as simple as an exchange. Christ takes our sins and gives us his righteousness so that, through him, we are accounted as righteous as God himself. In this way, sin is no longer attributed to us. It no longer has to keep us separated from him. Murderers, adulterers, bigots, liars, thieves, and even the incestuous can all be viewed as righteous as God himself. And this wonderful gift, this accounting of righteousness, comes to them by faith, and faith alone. Hence the phrase, righteousness by faith. But it does not end there either. Through Jesus, 
murderers, adulterers, bigots, liars, thieves, and even the incestuous can enter into a relationship with God. Because Jesus' blood brings not only forgiveness, but also cleansing, healing, and restoration. Through Christ, we are born again. And through this experience, God writes his holy law upon the fleshly tables of our hearts. Thus, murderers, adulterers, bigots, liars, thieves, and the incestuous no longer do the things they used to do. From and by this inward law, all of life is shaped for the believer. These people desire to work out what God puts within them, and that desire is matched with the promise of divine power. Here is the essence of what it means to live in covenant relationship with God. This quarter, we look more closely at what God's covenant is, what it offers, even what it demands. Though drawn from many sources, the lessons rely heavily on the work of the late Gerhard Hazel, whose insights into the Word, where the covenant promises are revealed, will give encouragement, hope and understanding in order that we can learn something that perhaps Hobbes never did. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Lesson 1 for March 27 to April 2, ready for teaching on April 3, what Happened? Read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 27. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come as we start this whole new series of lessons about your covenant relationship with us and how you have led in the past, how you are leading now and you will continue to lead in the future. We pray that as we open your word, that not only will we discover what the covenants are, but that we may see in those the great love that you had in sending Jesus, that each of us could have eternal life as part of the covenant relationship with you. Bless us now as we open your word, as each of us in whatever part of the world we are listening and reading, we pray that you will guide us in our own personal lives, with our families, with the interrelationships we have with those about us, and may we be each part of the solution for the lives of others in telling them about the loving Jesus and his soon return. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. And that's from the New Revised Standard Version. The biblical account of the creation of humanity is one filled with hope, happiness and perfection. Each day of creation ended with the divine pronouncement that it was good. Certainly, that didn't include typhoons, earthquakes, famine and diseases. What happened? The sixth day of creation ended with the divine pronouncement that it was very good. That is, because that day the Lord created beings in his own image, humans, something he had not done with anything else in the Genesis account. Of course, these beings were perfect in every way. They'd have to be. After all, they were made in the image of God. Thus, of sheer necessity, they did not include murderers, thieves, liars, swindlers, and the vile in their ranks. What happened? This week's lesson looks at the creation, at what God had first made, and then at what happened to that perfect creation. Finally, it touches on the quarter's theme what God is doing to make things right again. And, for the week at a glance, what does the Bible teach about origins? What kind of relationship did God want with humanity? 
What was the purpose of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What hope was given to Adam and Eve immediately after they fell? Sunday, March 28. Turtles all the way down. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, we read in Genesis 1, verse 1. A scientist had just lectured on the orbits of the planets around the sun and the orbit of the sun around the centre of the galaxy when an elderly woman in tennis shoes rose and said that the earth was a flat disk sitting on the back of a turtle. The scientist, jesting, asked what the turtle sat on, and she responded that it sat on another turtle. Ma'am, the scientist continued joking, what then does that turtle sit on? She answered, another turtle. But before he could ask what that turtle sat on, she wagged her finger in his face and snapped, save your breath, Sonny, it's turtles all the way down. However cute, that story deals with the most crucial issue of human existence, the nature of the universe itself. What is this world that we find ourselves in by no choice of our own? Why are we here? How did we get here? And where are we all finally going? These are the most basic and fundamental questions people could ask because our understanding of who we are and how we got here will impact our understanding of how we live and how we act while we are here. Question. Look up the following texts. Genesis 1, 1, Psalm 100, verse 3, Isaiah 40, 28, Acts 17, 26, Ephesians 3, 9, and Hebrews 1, 2, and 10. How does each one, in its own way, answer some of the above questions? What is the one point that they all have in common? Let's start with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, He is God, and it is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture, and... Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not heard, have you not known, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. And Acts 17, 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And Ephesians 3, and verse 9, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. And Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And verse 10, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. What is interesting about Genesis 1 verse 1, or even the other texts, is that the Lord does not attempt to prove that he is the creator. There are no elaborate arguments to make the point. Instead, it is simply and clearly stated, with no attempt to justify, explain, or prove it. Either we accept it on faith, or we do not. In fact, faith is the only way that we can accept it for one simple reason. None of us were here to see the creation process itself. It would indeed have been a logical impossibility for us to have been there at our own creation. Even secularists, whatever view of origins they hold, have to take that view on faith for the same reason that we as creationists have to. None of us were there to view the event. And so to finish today. Nevertheless, even if God has asked us to believe in him as creator, he does not ask us to believe without giving us good reasons to believe. 
realising that there is a certain amount of faith required in almost everything we believe, write down some reasons why it makes sense to have faith that we are here because the Creator purposely put us here, as opposed to our origins being rooted in nothing but pure chance. Monday, March 29, in the image of the Maker. Our verse today is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. The Bible states that God created humankind, male and female, in his own image. Genesis 1 27. Use this idea to answer the following questions. 1. What does it mean that God created us in his own image? In what ways are we in his own image? 2. According to the Genesis account, did the Lord make anything else in his own image other than humankind? If not, what does that tell us about our unique status in contrast to the rest of the earthly creation? What lessons can we draw from this contrast? 3. What else can be found in the account of the creation of the humankind that sets the race apart from anything else the Lord had created? Well, we've got an answer here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And then later in the chapter, in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Although we must speak of God in human terminology, we must not forget that he is a spiritual being, as we read in John 4.24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth, a spiritual being possessing divine characteristics. All we can say is that in our physical, mental and spiritual natures, we reflect in some way our divine creator, however much there remains about him that, at least for us, is still shrouded in mystery. The Bible emphasizes, however, the spiritual and mental aspects of our mind. These aspects we can develop and improve. It is the uniqueness of the human mind that makes possible a nourishing relationship with God, something the rest of God's earthly creation seems unable to do. Notice, too, the unique account of how God made woman. Both men and women share the incredible privilege of being made in the image of God. In their creation, there is no hint of inferiority of one to the other. God himself made them both from the same material. God made both equal from the start and placed them together in a special relationship with him. Both had the same opportunity to develop their God-given characters in a way that would bring glory to him. As we read in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46, God himself gave Adam a companion, 
He provided an help meet for him, a helper corresponding to him, one who was fitted to be his companion and who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. End of quote. Tuesday, March 30. God and humankind together. Our text for today is Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Notice God's first spoken words to humankind, at least as they appear in Scripture. He points them to their ability to procreate, to reproduce more of their own kind. He also points them to the earth itself, to the creation, and tells them to replenish it, to subdue it, and to have mastery over it. He also points them to the plants they can eat. In short, according to the Bible, God's first words to man and woman deal specifically with their interaction and relationship with the physical world. Question. What do Genesis 1, 28 and 29 tell us about how God views the material world? Do they imply that there is something bad in material things and our enjoyment of them? What lessons can we learn from these early scenes in human history about how we should relate to the creation itself? Also with these words, God takes the first steps toward a relationship with humankind. He speaks to them, gives them commands, tells them what to do. There's a responsibility implicit in these words too. God has asked them to be masters over this wonderful creation that he himself has made. Question. Genesis 1.28 says that God blessed Adam and Eve. What does that mean? What kind of relationship does it imply between them and their creator? Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God addressed Adam and Eve as intelligent beings who could respond to his kindness and enter into communication and fellowship with him. Also, as creature children, Adam and Eve were dependent upon the blessing and care of their Creator Father. He provided all they needed. They did nothing to deserve what he gave them. They were purely recipients of something they did not earn. And so to finish the day, when we read about the creation of man and woman, we can see elements, before sin, of the kind of relationship God wants us to have with him now, after sin. Review the day's study and see what parallels you can find that help us understand how we can relate to him, even in our fallen condition. Wednesday, March 31, at the tree. And the Lord God commanded the man, we read in Genesis two sixteen and 17, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. 
This test provided Adam and Eve with an opportunity to exercise their free will. It also challenged them to respond positively or negatively to their relationship with the Creator. It also shows that God had made them free moral beings. After all, if they did not have the opportunity to disobey, why would the Lord have even bothered warning them, in the first place, against disobedience? H. C. Leupold, in Expositions of Genesis, published in 1942, Volume 1, page 127, writes, Everything preceding in this chapter has paved the way for this climax in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The future of the race centres upon this single prohibition. Man is not to be confused by a multiplicity of issues. Only one divine ordinance must be kept in mind. By thus limiting the number of injunctions to one, Yahweh gives tokens of his mercy. Besides, to indicate that this one commandment is not grievous, the Lord sets it against the background of a broad permission. From every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. End of quote. By calling Adam and Eve to obey his will, God was saying, I am your creator and I have made you in my image. Your life is sustained by me, for by me you live and move and have your being. I have provided all things for your well-being and happiness, sustenance, home, human companionship, and have established you as ruler of this world under me. If you are willing to affirm this relationship with me because you love me, then I will be your God and you will be my children. And you can affirm this relationship and the trust implicit in it by simply obeying this specific command. In the end, our relationship with God can be effective and lasting only if we freely choose to accept His will. In essence, rejecting His will is to claim independence from Him. It indicates that we believe we do not need Him. That is a choice that results in the knowledge of evil, and evil leads to alienation, loneliness, frustration and death. And so to finish today, the test God gave Adam and Eve was one of loyalty and faith. Would they be loyal to their Creator, who had given them everything they needed, plus a world of delights, or would they go their own way, independent of His will? Would they have enough faith in Him to take Him at His word? Their loyalty and faith were tested by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In what ways do we face similar tests every day? How does God's law function as a parallel to the command given in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17? And the Lord God commanded the man, we read in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Thursday, April 1. Breaking the Relationship We tend to believe people we know and instinctively distrust those whom we do not. Eve naturally would have distrusted Satan. Furthermore, any direct attack against God would have made her defensive. What steps, then, did Satan take to bypass Eve's natural defences? Let's read the story in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, 
and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. From the Seventh Day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 231, we read, Deplorable as was Eve's transgression, and fraught as it was with potential woe for the human family, her choice did not necessarily involve the race in the penalty for her transgression. It was the deliberate choice of Adam in the full understanding and express command of God rather than hers that made sin and death the inevitable lot of mankind. Eve was deceived. Adam was not. End of quote. As a result of this blatant transgression and disregard of God's command, the relationship between God and humankind is now broken. It changed from open fellowship with God to fleeing in fear from his presence, as we read in verses 8 to 10. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Alienation and separation replace fellowship and communion. Sin appeared, and all its ugly results followed. Unless something was done, humanity was heading for eternal ruin. Question, in the midst of this tragedy, what words of hope and promise did God speak? Genesis 3 verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God's surprising word of prophetic hope speaks of a divinely ordained hostility between the serpent and the woman, between her offspring and his offspring. This climax is in the victorious appearance of a representative offspring of the woman's seed who delivers a deadly blow to the head of Satan, while he would be only able to bruise the Messiah's heel. In their utter helplessness, Adam and Eve were to gain hope from this messianic promise, hope that would transform their existence, because this hope was God-given and God-supported. This promise of the Messiah and of final victory, however vaguely stated at that time, lifted the gloom into which sinning had placed them. And so to finish the day, read Genesis 3, 9, where God says to Adam and Eve, Where are you? Genesis 3 and verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? God, of course, knew where they were. His words, instead of being filled with condemnation, were to draw guilt-ridden humankind back to him. In short, God's first words to fallen humanity came with the hope of his grace and mercy. Even now, in what ways do we find God seeking to call us to his mercy and grace? Friday, April 2. Further thought. The Bible overflows with calls to sinners and backsliders. We're going to compare several verses here. Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, he will not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. And Isaiah 55 Verses 1 and 2, Ho, every one who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. 
Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. And verses 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And Luke 15, verses 3 to 7, So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost, until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What others can you find? From the book The Treasury of the Bible, the Old Testament, by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, page 11 in volume 1 we read there was a gospel sermon i think in those three divine words as they penetrated the dense part of the thicket and reached the tingling ears of the fugitives where art thou thy god is not willing to lose thee he has come forth to seek thee just as by and by he means to come forth in the person of his son not only to seek but to save that which now is lost. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, because the kind and caring God is the one who seeks humankind, how can we respond to this expression of love by the Father and Jesus Christ even now? How does the Lord expect us to respond? Two, contrast the biblical picture of humankind as fallen from a lofty place in God's creation and in need of redemption with the evolutionary theory of development. What offers more hope and why? And three, how essential are loving relationships to human happiness? Why is a flourishing connection to God necessary to such relationships? Discuss the influence of healthy human relationships on the persons in those relationships, parent-child, friend-to-friend, husband-to-wife, employer-to-employee, etc. And so to summarise this week's lesson, God created us in his own image so that a loving fellowship could exist between him and us. Although the entrance of sin shattered the original union, God seeks to restore this relationship through the plan of redemption. Life for us as dependent creatures takes on true meaning and clarity only when we enter into union with our Creator. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled First Deaf Theology Student and it's by Jose Rodrigo Martinez Patron. My Seventh-day Adventist mother noticed that I, as a baby, did not respond to sounds in our home in Merida, Mexico. She would call my name and I did not notice. Mother sought help when I was about two. She sent me to a special needs school that taught me sign language and how to speak. My teacher taught me the sounds of letters and words. I put my hand to her throat when she spoke and then tried to replicate the sound with my own throat. My mother cried because her son couldn't hear her voice. Don't worry, the teacher said. Have patience. Everything will work out fine. I attended the special needs school for two hours every day. I also studied at an Adventist school for two hours daily. The church school taught me how to read and write, and most important, it taught me about God. 
I attended the Adventist school up to the age of eight, but the school didn't have teachers who knew sign language. So mother ended up sending me to a public school with teachers who could communicate with me. The first time that I met other Adventist young people with hearing impairments was at a church-organised conference at Linda Vista Adventist University. It was wonderful to mingle with other Adventist young people with the same needs as mine. I was invited to attend the annual conference again in two years. Then the Inter-American Division organised its first special needs conference and held the event at Montemorelos University in Monterrey, Mexico. At the conference, a desire grew in me to serve God as a pastor. But how? I could never afford the tuition. As the conference concluded, University President Ismael Castillo made a surprising announcement. Do any of you want to study here? he asked. He offered a full scholarship for the tuition. I understood then that God was calling me to be a pastor, and I stood up. I am the first deaf theology student at Montemorelos University. This is my second year at the university. It is difficult because no one knows sign language. I concentrate hard and try to read the teacher's lips. I failed several classes my first year, and I have to retake those classes. I have led several evangelistic meetings for the hearing impaired, including in Mexico City. Churches with deaf people invite me to preach. I have a huge desire in my heart to graduate and serve as a pastor. I dream about going to the mission field, perhaps to Spain as a missionary to the hearing impaired. Please pray for the hearing impaired. We all have dreams. We are willing to do big things for the Lord. And there's a photo of Jose Rodrigo Martinez, patron, to our left here, a handsome-looking young man. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a missionary training centre at Montemorelos University in Mexico. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.